Hey everyone, this is Viz from Haggerty's Music in Rapid City, South Dakota. I get to sit here with none other than the man himself from Taylor Guitars, Mr. Bob Taylor. Uh, we're going to talk about a new series of guitars, among other things today. Uh, Bob, let's jump right into it. Why are we here today? Well, we get to talk about Legacy Series here. There's five guitars. It's great. Plus, we get to hang. Absolutely. Yeah. I tell this story. When we first came out with this guitar, and I was... Uh, well, the, the very first version of this was non-cutaway 20th anniversary guitar. And then a year later, or immediately following that, we had the 514 CE. I was at Nashville, and some cat was sitting down there like this, you know. And I'm, I'm just, we have like this little booth, and, and he's just sitting there. And I, I'm, I'm walking through the booth, and I'm like, Y'all Bob Taylor? I go, that's me. He goes, oh, I love this guitar. <laughs> Want me to tell you why? I'm like, lay it on me, brother. He goes, I'm a studio musician here in Nashville. And I do this eight hours a day. <laughs> <laughs> and this guitar does this better than any guitar I ever had. <laughs> Very true. Yeah, and I'm are. like, I'll take it. <laughs> yeah, no I'll kidding. take it. No kidding, yeah. yeah. They're phenomenal. And that's, you know, I, I grew up playing these, like the- Did you really? The- uh, Oh man, I'm so to, old. To a degree. People grew up while I was alive. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Well, it's like, you know, so my, my hometown's in Minnesota, mm -hmm. and uh, all of the guitar shops, like, didn't have Martins for whatever reason. And like, you know, growing up when you're, it, it, discovering the guitar and learning the big names gibson you know martin fender and like uh i i didn't really even know about taylor until like i walked into a guitar center one day or something like that with my dad and you know playing the chords on that and Im immediately my dad was like that is a beautiful sounding guitar yeah and uh you know all the shops just had them so it, it's just kind of like what i'm familiar with and it's just like so crisp and like they're they're so a character of their own like in a in a in a sea of different brands and styles and philosophies of building, you know, uh -huh. Taylor is like, oh my gosh, dude, they're, well, you they're know, very inspiring. I've, I've like. always been like, I don't want to answer the question of which is my favorite guitar, but this last year I got freed of that because we got these made again, and I played that eight ten, and I have this guitar right here. Mm -hmm. Well, this it's a little more square. That's 49 years old, I made it in the first year that we started, or maybe I even made it in 74. It might be 50 years old. I can't remember exactly. I just remember making it for myself, and it really is the first 810. It's this binding, it's this wood. It really? doesn't have this bridge. It's more of like a, a Martin-style bridge. Um, it's got this pick guard. It's got these inlays. It's got that peg head binding, and it's got two holes in here because it's had several pickups in it, mm -hmm. right? And so there was a time we had a bags pickup in here with a Bartolini preamp when Bill Bartolini wow. has, was starting his company. He made that for us. And that's the guitar I played. All, all of my playing forever and ever for 50 years was on that guitar. So I'm happy to say the 810. And the 514CE. Absolutely. And the 855. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. Eric told me about what was going what was going on with these series. And I'm like, I got super excited immediately when I heard Dreadnought. Like, because man, they're you know, it's it's what we think of when we think of acoustic guitars, right? It's it's the, the the quintessential body shape, like it's it's the schema that all of our brains go to when we think acoustic guitar. And you know, actually the camera's pointing right now at the two most copied shapes of guitars in the world. Ours isn't a Martin Dreadnought, but still. Right. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That's the most copied shape. Yeah. The second most is the 14 CE, the Grand Auditorium CE. I mean, you just wouldn't believe when we go through any trade show anywhere in the world. You know, there's these times when people would borrow our guitars. Could we borrow a guitar at a trade show to show our amp or borrow a guitar to show our capo, borrow a guitar, and I go, oh, I didn't know that those guys borrowed one of our 614, that's not a 614 CE, you know, <laughs> and and so it's 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 kind of funny. I even, I even smirk a bit because Martin <laughs> started doing a grand auditorium shape and it's like, okay, like, that's, like, to me, that's, uh, that was really eye-opening when I first saw those coming, I'm like, wow, like, how long, how long has the Dreadnought been, like, 
the standard shape to be compared to, you know? Yeah. And then all of a sudden, <clears throat> this company that's been doing it for nearly 200 years is, is taking your shape. And that's, that's got to be a very uh, surreal experience for you as a guitar builder. Yeah, it, you know, especially a guitar builder's been doing it for 50 years now. So, I mean, I've never really felt like ever that we have legacy to talk about because we are the new kids on the block at a half a century old. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're 12 years older than Microsoft, you know? <laughs> <laughs> that really puts it into perspective. You know what I mean? <laughs> and and, um, and it's, it's, it's kind of funny. It's, and everybody that builds guitars, I, I got to tell you, is always jealous of envious of what somebody else is doing that they admire, right. you know? And it's like, I want to get in that game too. Right. You know? I want to yeah. get in that game. We, we, we all do it. We all do it. All of us are friends. I got to tell you, we're all friends. Everybody makes acoustics. And I'm friends with so many electric guitar manufacturers. Um, but uh, we, we basically admire each other's work. And then we come back and do our thing. Yeah, there's there's got to be a camaraderie between all that I imagine. Like, you know, I I think uh, so when I was when I was writing my questions, you know, to interview the the ever so innovative Bob Taylor, it's like I remember sitting down in my chair and thinking like, well, where do you even begin? Because I, I see you as sort of like a, a modern day titan of the guitar world, right? Like you have Gibson and Martin and Fender that have you know very long historical. Um, beginnings, you know, s some in the 1800s. Mm -hmm. And like you said, you guys are the new kids on the block, you know, starting in 1974. And uh, so, the, so the first question, you know, I really wanted to ask you was just kind of really broad. In your personal philosophy, like what makes a good guitar? Okay. Um, <clears throat> you got to get sound in the ballpark of good sound. Once you're in the ballpark, you're playing. Mm. All the teams are in the ballpark. Everyone who didn't get into the park, their sounds, I can say, is not good. Okay. Okay. You got to get in the ballpark. Once you're there, you can't win on sound. Because you play that guitar, you love it, somebody else might not. And if I make it more like they want it to be, it's going to be, your hand's going to come down. Okay. Right? Mm -hmm. That's what I learned. Um, so there's two other things that, that I think are objective, less subjective. And one of them is, how does it play? And the other is, how consistently is it made and comes into a store? Because the, the, the guitar store is the, it's, it's the uh, delivery center, mm -hmm. you know? Um, it's where guitars, newly born guitars go, and they get out to the people who are going to play them. Yep. And, and so um, stores want guitars to come in ready to go. Yeah, yeah. And so those are the two things that I, I worked on, sort of, you know, getting my self-taught PhD in making guitars that play well. Absolutely. And part of that was making guitars that could be repaired well. And so, you know, you get into how I view the neck attachment, and the, because what makes a guitar not play well often is that after, over some period of time, the neck is moved, it's pulled up, the top is shrunk, the soft is bowed, I mean, swollen, mm -hmm. the guitar is distorted, and you can't really do enough with the saddle or the bridge to fix that. You've got to reset that. So why not just be able to take it off? So that's my three-point strategy. Two objectives, one subjective. Very one, interesting. I want to make a guitar that's easy to play. That's the on-ramp for mm -hmm. being able to play music. Two, I want to make a guitar that's consistent when it comes into a store or when someone buys it and is easily returned to that condition yep. in the future. And three, I want to be, I want to, I want to be a part in the sound. I want, yeah. to be in, I want to be in the ballpark of good sound. Absolutely. Well, yeah. I, I think I can speak on behalf of guitar players <laughs> everywhere to say, I think you did it. Thank you. you. Know, and this is something I talk to customers about all the time where it's, you look at all the different manufacturers, they all have their own kind of flavors, you know, and the analogy I use is I, I could have your grandmother and my grandmother follow the same chocolate chip cookie recipe, yeah, you're so right. <laughs> but there's going to be those little subtleties between them. And 
I've said so, so many times that, you know, playability and consistency is what you guys bring to the table. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone, when they go to an ice cream shop, they want a free sample of something before they decide on, oh, I think I'll go with that yeah. one, right? Yeah. Your guys' quality control is is unbeatable. So when you come into a, a store that, that sells these guitars, like, you know what you're going to get. It's going to be crisp every time. So when people play that that first E major chord, they're they're mm -hmm. taken away. You know, it's mm -hmm. crisp, it's bright, it's bassy. And uh, yeah, as far as playability, like I have yet to play an acoustic guitar that has anything on a Taylor as far as playability wow. goes. Man, it's it's pretty you. remarkable. <laughs> but, well, see, you're the guy who's, when I say, um, who thinks of the best selling guitars? <laughs> you, you put your hand up. But I really learned that some people are like, nah, that's not my favorite guitar mm -hmm. because they're thinking of a guitar. And so <clears throat> this is why, um, but, but I will say that our, guitar, our, our guitars have characteristics that, well, if you love it, it's kind of like you might love your grandma's chocolate chip cookies more than my grandma's chocolate chip cookies, mm -hmm. right? But, um, <clears throat> but, you can, one thing that our guitars do really well and always have is they record well, they amplify well, they, they play well in a, a band situation where there's keyboard, drums, bass, that mm -hmm. type of music, they tend to cut through and that's a sort of a characteristic. So our guitars are bassy, but they're not too bassy. I like Taylor Swift, she, she was asked a question once, like, should a girl, girl's dress be short? She's like, it should be short, not too short. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think a guitar should be bassy, but not too bassy. <laughs> okay, that's, that's very interesting. Yeah. So, all right, so <clears throat> it's, it's very surreal to me. I thought I would be a lot more nervous coming into this room today, like meeting you, because again, you know, modern titan of the guitar world. And it's not every day you get to talk to the guy whose name is on the headstock of the guitar I own at home. Yeah. And, you know, that's, that's, you know, first off, super thankful that you've had me. So thank you so much for, for taking the time to talk to me. You bet. So I'd, I'd like to me. pick your brain. Like how I kind of wanted to go about talking to you is kind of looking back, getting to today, and maybe looking towards the future. Um, so I'd, I'd like to pick your brain just kind of about like Taylor's past. Okay. Talk a little bit about, you know, we just celebrated 50 years of business. So yeah. that's a really big, you know, other, uh, you know, new kid on the block or not, 50 years of business is nothing to bat your eyelashes at. That's a very big deal. Um, and then looking forward, we have these new series of guitars, but you, you and Kurt, have built this remarkably successful company and I think it's grounded in inspiration and innovation. I, I'm so curious as to what you and Kurt's initial goals were setting out when you were starting in 1974. Like, did you ever envision that Taylor would be operating at the scale that it is today? Um, or was it always just kind of that simple mentality of let's just make good guitars? Like, what was the mindset when you were starting out? Well, um, we were in a foxhole when we started, so the, the mindset wasn't um, much more than we got to live to fight another day. It was a lot of years before we um, really started achieving success. And you have to understand that in 74 when we started, um, companies like uh, Martin had achieved their highest production rate of uh, 130 years that they had been in business, or 140 years, whatever it was, oh my gosh. And um, they were making 80 guitars a day, 20,000 guitars a year. And that number is such a low number in today's market. Sure. You know, I mean, that's a lot of guitars, but now we talk about our guitars in multi hundreds per day, you know, so we could have, I could have never imagined this in my wildest dreams, you know, what could it be? Mm -hmm. But the, the market right now is so much larger than it was then. And it was at a peak mm -hmm. and then Saturday night fever and disco came out in 78, 79 and boy, it was over. And then when guitars got back on the scene, it was glam rock. You know, so guitars, music guitars really suffered through that time. 
Um, but I would say that uh, one of our great motivations was to um, not to, to not have to quit and go get a job. I'll tell you the the thing that kept me going through the first almost ten years when it was really really hard was I would imagine myself going into the grocery store, running into someone I haven't seen for four or five years, and they go, hey, you still doing that guitar thing? Remember, I was 19 when I started. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking this when I'm 22, 23, yep. and me saying, no, I had to give that up, it didn't work. And every time I just replayed that little scene, I'm like, I'm not having that conversation. Mm -hmm. I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna be in the grocery store telling somebody that I couldn't make it work. Yep, you know? that's that's something I that, remember. That was my goal, was to not have that conversation. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was a counselor for many years, and I would I would tell a lot of the people that I work with, you know, fear can keep us away from doing the things we love to do, but sometimes fear is sometimes the greatest motivator in that yeah. sense, where you play a certain scene in your head, like, I, I don't want that to happen. And so you do everything scene. you can to move away from that. Yeah. But yeah, like... Because I was learning how to make guitars, yeah. At the same time, we were learning how to be in business. Mm -hmm. I mean, both of those things at the same time. Plenty of competition in yeah. the moment. That that's what that's another thing I was curious about. Like, you you got started when brands like Martin and Gibson already had a very firm grip on the acoustic guitar market. And do you think you guys planned to differentiate yourself, or how mm -hmm. was the the mindset when you started going building into guitars like? Did you still see yourself as such a small fish that it's just there's no point in competing with them? Or um, do, you, do you find yourself that the design of the guitars were kind of shaped to stand out from the Martins or Gibsons at the time or uh, or something else? When I started, none of the above. We, uh, we weren't trying to compete against competition. We were trying to compete against our own lack of knowledge. We we're just trying to make a guitar. Okay, we got that one done. Now let's see if we can sell it. We found a dealer, you know, and they sold it. Okay, that was encouraging. Let's see if we can do that again. I have to tell you that my first three guitars that I built in my life, I'd never heard of Martin. I'd heard of Gibson because my dad was in the Navy and one of the his buddies in the Navy had a Gibson electric guitar, and so I heard of that company, mm -hmm. and I'd never heard of Fender. Never even, so when I started making guitars, and it was like, somehow for me, in my world, it was an original thought. It wasn't like, wow, I, I wanna make a guitar as, as good as that. Then, I discovered Martin, and I, when I sold one of my motorcycles, I bought a D18 at the local store for $450. And I just looked inside of it. I mean, I didn't, I wasn't like, oh, this is easy to play, this is hard to play. That thought didn't cross my mind. Oh, this sounds good, it doesn't sound good. That thought didn't cross my mind. I looked at the binding, I looked inside, and I'm like, look inside that thing. That thing's, I want to make a guitar that looks like that inside. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't say I want to make guitar sounds like that, feels like this, plays like this, plays music like that. I just wanted to make a guitar that, you know, the lines were clean and the mm -hmm. work was nice. It's more so, about the skeleton than the meat on the bones. Yeah, I, I often tell people, here's how Bob Taylor plays guitars. <laughs> That's... That's how Bob Taylor plays guitar. For sure. I just like I just start looking at it as much as I do playing it. Yes. You know? I, I've heard I've I've listened to other interviews uh, with you and I've I've seemed to learn that you're definitely a man of process over product. Yeah, I feel like um, well there was a point we were in business for a little while and we went to uh, Germany to the trade show in Frankfurt and Kurt and I went and visited a Mercedes-Benz factory, and I looked at that and I thought, man, they left no stone unturned here. They're making Mercedes-Benz cars with regular people in a factory. Mm. And nobody that I see here can go home and make a car, right? What if I started working on the process of building a factory 
it's, that's a holistic thing. It's not just the tool you have, but it's how you train, how you treat, and you know how the whole thing works. Yeah. Could I end up making a guitar that's really good in that situation using people who work here? Right. That's what I wanted to do, and so um, I I really started working on the process, and then I was critical about how it turned out. You know, mm. oh, this isn't turning out well. Okay, well, I have two guys doing that. One does it well, and one doesn't so well. So, uh, doesn't do it so well. So, I, I always uh, felt that in 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 the business, in our business, I had um, education or training. I'll say training, organization, technology. Those are, that's my three-legged stool. Okay. One of those is, is going to be. Every solution is going to fit in one of those things. Mm -hmm. And I always tried to keep them, not one of them, way far out in front of the other. Yeah. So I didn't want so much technology that, you know, you really don't want a machine that spits out guitar necks more than you need. You yes. know, that would cost too much. Yes. And you wouldn't get a return. I didn't want to just train people, train people, train people, train people, turn every single person into a handmade luthier because... That's not going to get you where you want to go. Sure. They're going to go leave, start their own shop. There's a, there's a limit to that. I remember when Larry Breedlove started working uh, here, and I thought, you know, if I can teach Larry Breedlove how to do this, I could teach another person how to do this. And Larry could teach one, and they could teach one. But that falls apart when mm -hmm. you get too many people. So you're right. I love the process. Yeah. And the process is how I get to a guitar. That's I'm I'm having kind of a very uh, interesting like, uh, what's the word? Very so philosophical moment in my head here because I'm I'm really starting to come to terms with. It seems that your process seems to intersect with the product in that that they're both very balanced. You know, you didn't want to put all your eggs into one basket. You seem to have a very good control between every single support beam that's holding this house up of the company and that balance comes across in not only the design of the guitar, but the sound of them as well. So yeah. that, that to me is, is really interesting. Well, I, ha I had to go through a lot of guitar player opinions, you know, oh, Taylor uses machines. Oh, okay, well, like at what point, what, at what point is a guitar handmade? Mm -hmm. um, let's go all the way back to buying a pencil and making a template to draw a shape. Oh, well, that's a tool, yeah. you know. You bend sides on a pipe, okay, that's great great for the theater of it. It's not really great for the side, mm -hmm. you know. That's, so it, what's really interesting is guitar building was not really industrialized well when I came on the scene. It was still, I would say, pretty clunky factories. Okay. Um, and some guitar designs dumbed down to be able to use maybe furniture type of uh, equipment because guitar companies would borrow methods from a larger industry, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I was always able to achieve a higher production or higher facility by making something better. And people always go, well, isn't it worse if you do it that way? Well, how about if I build a side bender that rocks and it makes a perfect side? How's that, mm -hmm. how did the guitar suffer? The side's not ripply. I didn't have to sand the ripples out, make thin spots, thick spots, thin spots, thick spots. You know, yep. all that, those kind of hidden things yep. that are on a lot of guitars that a player would never see. There's beauty so. and consistency. There really is. Yep. And then yeah, 50 years later, you know, people are still loving them. Um, talking about that quickly. Um, I've said it a couple times already, but new kids on the block. I don't care. New kids on the block in the terms of, you know, longevity of other companies. Mm -hmm. 50 years of business is a big deal. Like, what does that mean to you and Kurt, you know, all this time later where you guys have, I think you, you guys sit atop the throne of acoustic guitars nowadays. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, you really have a brand that is so inspiring and very down to earth and is starting to develop that Americana feel. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder in your head, like looking back, at that process up until today, like what does that mean when you when you hear fifty years of business now? 
Well, I'll tell you what, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's an arbitrary number, but, it's a, but it turned out to be really important in my life. I've been in, I've been in business for every year from one till 50, mm -hmm. you know, 10 years was cool. Didn't make me feel like I did. I, I, then I felt like, well, I stayed in business for 10 years. Whew, that was an accomplishment, but that's, uh, you know, not something that I could take out to the streets. But 50 years made me feel like, yeah, we've actually contributed, you know? And we and I feel okay about talking about that, you know? Mm -hmm. I didn't really feel, I was shy about talking about that kind of stuff, you know, earlier. But something magical happened to me at 50. That's awesome. You know? Mm -hmm. I'm yeah, like, it's... yeah, I can talk about it. And then, you know, we're coming out with this legacy series, and, and it's nice because our guitars have, you know, changed, advanced. We have a lot of different things going on. And then it's like, this would be a good year to introduce this series because it really is the guitars. I mean, this 855 that's behind us, that, you know, that's the guitar that Neil Young bought when I was <laughs> 21. Uh -huh. And... I went and watched him play it, and I thought, well, I'm on to something here. And <clears throat> I would sit there at a NAMM show just hoping to sell a guitar with a little, you know, pipe and drape booth and guitars lined up. And people would walk right past me to the Dean booth. By the way, I got together with Dean Zielinski just recently. We had a really great time, and he's still a brilliant guitar maker. They'd walk over there, the Dean girls, they're selling guitars, and people would walk by my booth and go, Taylor. Nice 12 strings. And then they keep going. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, we do have nice 12 strings. New. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. So yeah, let's let's talk about these. This is this is the the reason we're here. You know, this is this is a big deal. The legacy series. Like, what can you tell us about them? Like, I I well, I'll just I'll just ask the question simply. What is the legacy series? What was the inspiration behind creating this line of guitars? These guitars. We pulled out our tooling. These are guitars that we <clears throat> made for years and years and years. This is the refined version of the guitar I made 50 years ago. Okay. When I was, it was, it was either the first year or the second year that we started in business. I, I don't remember years very well. And it's, it's more or less the exact same bracing pattern. Um, Thicknesses, gauges, the neck is the neck is NT, where before the other the one that I made was uh, a bolt on, it was flush mm -hmm. here, had inserts and bolted on. But it's pretty much that same guitar. This 855 that we made for years and years. The 514 CE that we came out, this and the 714 CE. Th these five guitars that we're talking about, uh, we have an 815. Uh -huh. we, we quit making the mustache bridge early on. Uh, like that you see on this guitar. Yeah, that's a very imposing bridge. That was the first thing I noticed when I saw that guitar. I'm like, that is, that is very inspired and it, it's unique. Yeah, that bridge we made in, at the American Dream. We made that at early Taylor and for probably, I don't know, six, seven, eight years, nine years into mm -hmm. the 855 and the 815. But man, that bridge was hard to make. And it was hard for me to train people to glue that on and get the glue off without denting the top. And, and I guess we were mid 80s, 10, 12, 15 years into business. No, we were less than 12 years into business when we had to make this. We were making a guitar called the Artist Series and it had these flames that were stained around here. And mm -hmm. it was when guitars were too granola for regular everyday music MTV mm. and so we started to make some and then Prince you know started playing one and you know the guys in Alabama had one and you know and Larry Breedlove designed this bridge he's like let's do a different bridge and we loved it and we we adopted that yeah. so this we just went all the way back to that because we were more clever we know how to make that bridge and we know how to train yep and we know how to organize better Absolutely. than we did that then so these are as close to those guitars as they can be, except they're better. Because okay. all the little quirks and missteps 
that we did back then. Mm -hmm. we're, we're better at making guitars. Yeah. Better at putting on binding. It's revisiting the beginnings. It is. And at 50 years, it's like, okay, I do have a beginning. And it wasn't yesterday. It was a long time ago. Yeah. Let's make those guitars. I have a feeling that there's going to be Taylor lovers that are going to be thrilled to come try one of these guitars I, and own one. I really think they're going to want to own one because they're like, I haven't seen one of these mm -hmm. new for a really long time. I got to be honest, you know, when I when I stepped into this room here, I, this was the first one I grabbed because, you know, the dreadnought, you know, that's it's it's the end all be all shape. And I, I always do the E major test. And I, I tell you, that sound alone, like I, I definitely think one of these are, are in my future. To yeah, nobody can argue with what someone thinks about the guitar that they're playing. Yeah. And um, you and I love the same guitar. That's both of our favorite yeah. guitars. So, so this is the 810. Yes. It, it looks like a very classic recipe. Sitka spruce top, Indian rosewood back and sides. I noticed no ES2 in mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. um, intentional. Mm -hmm. What do we have in here in, in its place? This is a bags element. And the nerds, the guitar geeks, are going to pick up that there's an ES2 in this, mm -hmm. but there's not going to be an ES2 in these. Okay. We, we, we made some, and uh, so anyways, we failed in our organization. We made all the guitars, and they're, we're like, oh, we're going to put ES2 in the cutaways and put the element in this. It's like, no, 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 they don't get that. But, but okay. these are super early versions that we have just for this. But in these days, we used... Um, our first pickup was Marcus Berry. Okay. Our next pickup was a few iterations of Bags pickups. Then we switched to Fishman. Then we did some Bags. Anyways, um, and Fishman at the time had started making, their only product was the Martin Thin Line. Mm -hmm. That's what they made. And we've always had an eighth inch saddle. This is a little guitar history for the yeah. for us geeks. Yeah. And the connoisseurs out there, we yeah. got you. <laughs> and Lloyd's pickups had a brass bottom with stuff in it and like a graphite and then a bone bridge or a, you know, a, a phenolic bridge that was glued to the top. We always had kind of high saddles and sometimes those would snap off and Lloyd wasn't making under saddle pickups yet. Larry was making pickups that were 330 seconds wide. And for a couple of years, I had asked Larry Fishman, make an eighth inch wide one. Holy, you know, don't have the tooling. And finally, he's like, okay, I'm going to make one. And at that point, we started using some Fishman pickups. So, but um, we love this, this bags element, the little roller knob here. This was unheard of in those days. A volume and a tone mm -hmm. in the sound hole. Nobody, and you, and you know what? I got to say that everybody's pickups have advanced so far. You know, when you watch a guitar on television, if you can find television from 40 years ago and see a guitar, it doesn't sound that good. It sounds pretty quacky. Okay. And now almost all guitars sound good plugged in on TV. You, that's, that's how I measure it. People have come along. So very, very simple. No knobs coming through these. And um, uh, under saddle pickup element. And uh, that's appropriate for when we made those guitars. Okay. Except for the guitar is better than those. Mm -hmm. because, and the pickup is better than those. Gotcha. It's the same idea. If, if it's sticking with that revisitation theme, would I be correct to assume no V-class bracing then? No, this is X-braced. X-braced. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't be able to tell. <laughs> you definitely <laughs> wouldn't be able to tell. That's definitely got, man, this thing has a voice. A voice for sure. What do you got in your arms right there? Well, this is the 514 CE. Um, I have to say that the, that the Grand Auditorium Cutaway is the guitar that built Taylor guitars. Mm -hmm. This shape came out on our 20th year without a cutaway. And that's when I um, got that shape developed. Larry Breedlove and I worked on it. He'd do the drawing, I'd stand over his shoulder, I'd go out, he'd come back, we, <laughs> you know. And, um, and it's like, okay, now we have a guitar we can call our own. One thing I'll point out, Taylor's headstock, Taylor's pickguard, Taylor's bridge, Taylor's shapes, Taylor's inlays, all of our trade dress is uniquely Taylor. We've mm -hmm. never made, we've never made 
Gibson or a Guild or a Martin. You know, yeah. we've just only made tailors. And it's hard to make something original. But I didn't even know. Right. That, the, the ignorance can be bliss, right? <laughs> True. And, but the, some of the shapes, the shapes that we originally had were were basically the shapes that Sam Ratting had at the American Dream guitar shop that okay. I worked at and Kurt worked at for a year and a half before we bought his machines, took over his little lease, mm -hmm. you know, and started Taylor Guitars. And so we stuck with those. Somewhere in the 80s, we made the grand concert. Mm -hmm. We did that. We made the first one for a great friend and guitar player named Chris Proctor, who asked for a smaller body guitar with a wide neck. Yep. And he was a finger stylist. Played very lightly, and man, we were into pickups by then. It was, I can't tell you the amount of pickups that we put in and out of guitars for him or Dan Crary or big stars, you know, Clint Black, just go on and on and on ourselves, our regular customers. And we finally, tell all of that just got better. We got better. Everyone else got mm -hmm. better. Um, we drew this shape, and it's like, okay, that's a tailor shape. We went back and re redrew the grand concert to be a little bit more like this. Mm -hmm. And then we redrew our dreadnought, which was pretty square right here. And to kind of have the same type of flow that these did. Yep. And we even did that with the jumbo. You know, we refined the shapes, made all new molds. And they were such subtle changes. But um, maybe we could do B-roll of my 810 next to this 810. Ooh. So, you could, so people can be. go, all right, those things are brothers uh -huh. from 50 years apart this one's more refined mm -hmm. this one's a little more i'll say clunky you know the shape is a little less pretty mm -hmm. you know but it's the same guitar and you look down that thing and you're like man, man that'd be the guitar. ultimate guitar comparison i think you know that's yeah we'll do that we can um, gotta. we'll get you those those things that you can you can throw into your for sure. when we get here for sure absolutely mm -hmm. um Cedar top on that one? Cedar top. Cedar. Mahogany and cedar. I have to tell you, I love, I love the A10, Rosewood and Spruce. But, you know, Leo Kotke always said, the most important thing about a guitar is it's made out of mahogany. <laughs> <laughs> and mahogany just really, it's so open. I have a, I have a dreadnought that I made in 97 um, by hand just for myself. That's mahogany. Mm. And... Yeah, it's, it's, it, I, I always said that mahogany gives up its tone easily. You don't have yes. to, it does, it takes a soft hand, yep. you know, to get that tone out of there. If you're going to go hard, going to do some off-roading, you need rosewood. Absolutely. Right? Yep. I've always said if trees could talk, they would sound like mahogany. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a very, it's a very woody, snappy sound. And you know, the, the Grand Auditorium, I mean, let's... It, 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 those are pretty notes. The Grand Auditorium is essentially the same size as a Dreadnought. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, the waist is tighter, yep. so you lose some of that right there. But the cedar top is loose. I hate to use words like bright because some people say it's so mellow, and then some people say it's so warm, and then some people say it's so bright. And it's like, I don't know. Describing tone to me is like describing a taste. Yep, yep. The you know, guitar like, world can, is can full of onomatopoeia. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it is. It's like, what, what does vanilla taste like? Like vanilla. <laughs> yep, you typically go to comparative analysis. Like you'd, you'd say something that has vanilla in it, or yeah. you, you mean say, oh, it's very vanilla-y. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you have to hear it. And then the other thing that I've learned over the years is this is a transmitter, and this is a receiver, mm -hmm. right? And everybody's receiver is a little different. Yep. The transmitter kind of stays the same. Yep. And my receivers are seven years old now. <laughs> <laughs> they're refined. But I, they're but refined. I, yeah. <laughs> but they, but um, they're still hearing the things I love to hear. Yeah, I love these guitars. Oh, beautiful. Uh -huh. yeah. We got we to gotta get this one in your hands, too, because this one is definitely, I would say, the most imposing of the Legacy series. Can I yeah. trade you? Sure, sure. So tell us about this one. Well, our first guitars, 
our business in the beginning was probably more 12 strings than anything. Really? Why? Yeah, because we, you could play them. You know, we, we made 12 strings with heavy, heavy brace tops. The action on this is as good as a Rickenbacker, mm -hmm. and it's a big old guitar, and that's what we did back in the day. Quick Taylor history. We're in San Diego. Two hours north is Los Angeles. Part of Los Angeles is Laurel Canyon, Topanga Canyon, Santa Monica. In the 70s, that's when NM Music, David Geffen started these companies. The Eagles, Jackson Brown, Flying Burrito Brothers, Crosby, Stills, Nash, Mamas and the Papas, all this music flowed out of there. Yeah. We had a dealer, uh, Westwood Music, Fred Wallach, he's still a famous man today. He was a friend to all those musicians. They revere him look, to this day, like Fred Wallach got us going, because these kids would come down, eh? Trying to get my thing going. It could, it could be Glenn Fry. It could be, you know, Jackson Brown. It could be, you know, guys in the Little River Band. It could be, the, and and they're they're. Um, I need to get a guitar. Okay, here's a guitar. Come every Friday and pay me a little money. Go make your music. And he started putting these guitars and Taylor guitars in the hands of a lot of those people. That's right really there. Funny. So, ooh, we weren't there when. Jimi Hendrix and the Beatles and Eric Clapton and Cream and, you know, Led Zeppelin were defining what electric guitars were yeah. going to be. But we were kind of in the middle of a non-bluegrass folk music that had grown up and was turning into country rock yeah. in Los Angeles. And Fred was feeding tailors to these people. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them discovered these 12 strings. It, right. yeah, it was a very Americana sound. Yeah, you think of like Crosby, Crosby, Stills, and Nash, and the Eagles. Like vocals were kind of the main flavor of, of the music you heard, but you needed, you know, a, a musical support to bring that to life. And you know, thinking on that, like definitely, yeah, the acoustic guitar is you know, really what kind of I think brings that flavor to life. Yeah. See, here, here I am being Bob. Okay, I saw a little thing. It scraped off. That's good. Uh -huh. It's a little piece of something. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Super but, rare. Super rare edition right here. <laughs> yeah, a little, it was just a little thing on top Scratched of the Scratched by Bob Taylor. This is a premium right here, folks. <laughs> and, um, uh, but what happened in those days is there were all these electric guitar players that wanted to play acoustic, and they, they had never picked up a... You play this for a second. I guess play, I could. Play a bar chord at the fifth fret and tell me that guitar is not the easiest thing in the world to play. <laughs> Kid in the candy store. My no, God. but I'm telling you, but the 12 strings in those days, you could have pushed the strings down. You really, really could. And so this was sort of like, uh, it, it was a party trick, but I didn't know any different. Ooh, you know all the chords. Um, I didn't know any different. I was just like, well, I can tell this. I got to work on this thing until it's easy to. Play. Yeah. That's and by the time, by the way, when I was doing this, I got help from two people that I really will thank for the rest of my life. One is John Larrave, he, and another guy was the repairman named John Carruthers, who worked at uh, Wallachy Music. I go into his repair shop, and there's just like road cases with every famous person's name stenciled yeah. on it. And they both taught me a lot about fretting a guitar and making a straight guitar net. Hmm. Yep. Which but I'm forever grateful for. That is the stigma of 12 strings too. It's like how many times have you said that, you know, 12 string is just for the open chords only. Like you can't really play solos, but this is... Oh man, it's... It plays as easy as a grand concert does. <laughs> it really does. 
the neck's not too big. No, it's, it's not. Easy to, it's easy to play. You can navigate it. Doesn't it doesn't feel it, wide. It's This one right here, if it's... If this one got in the ballpark of good sound, I think it's sitting on the pitcher's mound. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I would uh, be so inclined to agree. Man, that has... Gregorian choirs don't there have you anything <laughs> on this sound here. This is yeah. beautiful. Yeah. And there's two other guitars in the line, which we're, we're not showing right here, but there's the Rosewood Cedar version of this. That I'm was really excited about that one. Yes, Rosewood and Cedar, that's got to be a really fun And then there's combo. the six-string version of that. Absolutely. Which sounds a lot like this. Mm -hmm. Maybe, I mean, it's bigger. So mm -hmm. it's bigger. Gotcha. Uh, looking into the sound holes here, I see a couple of autographs in there. Are those, are those uh, printed on there? Are those hand autographed? Oh, these yeah. are signed, yeah, and that's what... Are that's all the a, legacies going to feature that? They haven't told me, mm -hmm. but I know I've sound... I've... Are, we print our labels like eight up on a sheet, and I've signed stacks of them. Absolutely. So, <laughs> I imagine so. Well, there... <clears throat> and we're not, we're not putting a quantity on these, because I think people are going to buy them, and it's, you know, we're just going to make them. Yeah, no, I think you should. That's that seems like a pretty darn good idea. Uh, they, they and I've always so loved a rosewood guitar with white binding. I've just ever since I saw the Johnny Cash show when I was a kid, mm -hmm. and he played that beautiful black guitar with white binding, and I just look at that. That that looks like a nice guitar. Well, it turned out to be a D thirty five. You know. That's what he was playing. I didn't know that. I didn't. That it was years later before I'm like, oh, that's. But I like it. And you know, I might be the only person that talks about my guitars and mentions everybody else's guitars, because I love guitars. Yep. You know, I love, I love all the the work that other people do. Yes, it's mm -hmm. it's an art form. You mm -hmm. know, you gotta appreciate art. Some people, mm -hmm. their thing is wine. Some it's music, painting. Mm -hmm. This is a piece of wood with some strings on it that. Makes a very pleasant sound when plucked. It really does. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, to to kind of wrap up, Bob, like, man, phenomenal guitars. I'm I'm super. I was excited to hear that there was a new series coming out, and now that I've gotten to play all these and and talk to you about them, I you know I I I am so much more excited to start seeing these in the shop and getting them in the hands of customers that are gonna, I think, share my excitement with these. They're they're pretty awesome. Um, you don't, like I said earlier, you don't get to talk to the dude whose name is on the headstock every day. So I went to some of my coworkers mm -hmm. to uh, see what they would ask you if they were in this room. So if you don't mind, I have a couple of my coworkers' questions that they would uh, very much appreciate an answer to. Um, my coworker Caleb wants to know what you're most passionate about right, what you're most passionate about right now, and how that's going to affect Taylor Guitars culture in the coming future. I would say. <clears throat> Let me go back to the very beginning. Um, we were poor as church mice when we first started. Mm -hmm. And so one of my parallel goals to making good guitars was to make guitar building an actual career. Not like, oh, build guitars, sorry, I, I can't afford to go out for a burger, you know, kind of a thing. Right. Um, and so I've always been passionate about can Taylor Guitars provide good jobs all the way down to the dealers that are selling them, you know, and finally a good experience for the person who's playing, the person who's going to buy this thing, take it home, and have a good experience owning this thing. But I'm super passionate about the fact that we've become employee-owned and that our future looks good. And by the way, um, Next year, Andy's got some all brand new stuff too that's pretty exciting. So it's not just about legacy. He's, um, yeah, he's got some new things that haven't been thought of before that are packaged beautifully. I mean, I, I can't tell you too much except <laughs> for where Taylor isn't going backwards to where oh, this is where we're going to return to. We're still driving there, but 
I still want people to be able to get this. Yeah. So I'm passionate about that. I'm passionate about uh, the ecology of trees, being able to plant trees that we can use in the future, yes. being able to have a voice in the international community about how trees are utilized. That's a big um, deal. I, jars are made from wood. We People talk about, well, we're reaching the end. Well, we, we trees are smaller, the big stuff that's grown forever, but wood grows on trees and we can grow our future. <laughs> Absolutely. We can grow, grow trees like we grow food, except for it just takes a long mm. time. So let's get started now. I think the saying goes, uh, society grows better when men plant trees whose shade they will never sit in. Uh -huh. If you had to put a number to it, could you estimate how many trees you're responsible for planting on this earth? Um, we have now planted uh, 65,000 trees in our, wow. um, <laughs> in our African Cameroonian venture called the Ebony Project. Mm -hmm. Forty some thousand of those have been ebony trees. <clears throat> Nobody knew how to plant an ebony tree. Nobody knew how to get the seed to propagate. I mean, literally, mm -hmm. you know, it just, when we started into it, 10 years ago, we learned that everyone knows how to cut one, but nobody, nobody knows how to grow one. 40-some mm -hmm. thousand of those are ebonies. They're, growing, they're going strong. We don't own any of them. They're all owned by the villages that we help and pay yeah, to learned, learn yeah, how to plant them. That is and then awesome. we're up to 20-some thousand fruit trees planted in the same time because we want to address food security at the same time. And so we're teaching them how to plant a whole variety of fruits from avocados to mango to citrus to bush mango, which is not a mango like we think of it, but it's a very, very important um, food in their diet. Mm -hmm. um, they eat the seed, really, as they grind the seed and eat it. It's super nutritious. Um, and so anyway, there's that. And then in Hawaii, we were growing trees, not only reforesting areas that we get a contract to cut trees, and usually returning a, a six X, six times factor better forest than we left, but um, we own our own land as well. And we're putting 150,000 improved koa trees on that. I think we're close to 35 or 40,000 now, wow. and we'll have about five more years. We've got our groove down now, um, but we have to plant, wilt resistant trees because there's a fungus in Hawaii that kills all the trees in the tropical areas. And so we've been able to identify see trees that don't die, die from this, which was, it's not easy. We could talk for hours on that, but those are the only trees we're planting. So we know that we're gonna, um, it's gonna survive mm. any type of climate change that brings heat up the side of the mountain. And we'll be able to provide wilt-resistant seed to every place in Hawaii. So that, just that 560-some acres is going to give us 150,000 koa trees. We'll start using those trees only in about, I'm going to say 25 years from now. It's amazing. Think, those That's trees really grow amazing. so fast you can almost hear them grow. And um, uh, I mean, a seedling that you can't see is four times overhead in two years That's with amazing. a trunk this big around. So those are the two that we're doing. And then we're trying to prevent, we're trying to use trees that would go to waste with the urban woods that we're doing. The urban ash, um, the red iron bark. And when we make a blackwood guitar now, that blackwood doesn't come from Australia or Tasmania. It comes from Northern California street trees. Really? Yeah. That is really cool. You're, yeah. you're changing the world one guitar at a time. We're trying. That's that's amazing. And, you know, I think, unfortunately, I wish I had five more hours of your time. Like, this is this has been such an amazing interview. I really can't thank you enough for taking the time to sit down with me. I, I think on behalf of guitar players and uh, tree enthusiasts everywhere, I think thank you is the only words that I can come to mind to uh, really put to words of just how much you're doing, not only for the music community, but the global impact of the trees is, is so important. So we, we won't have this without the wood. 
and you're doing such an amazing job. So, Bob, thank you so much yes. for sitting down with me. My pleasure. These guitars are amazing. I can't wait till they're in the shop. I'm going to play them probably every day, and I will. I will. I will probably end up owning one of these. There's. There's no way. There's no way I can't have one now. You know. Yeah, I can't wait to see them in your store. Get feedback from you. Absolutely. You know what people think about these. And they're like Doritos. We'll make more, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I'll let you get back to saving the world. Thank you again so much, Bob. And for all you guitar players out there, keep an eye out for the new Legacy series from Taylor Guitars. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Thank you.